in the YouTube also, and people will come on, actually, you know, when you start all the time, there's less people than uh, ultimately, you know, there are many more people who comes on and it's no issue at all. We'll start on time. And so the, I'm Dr. Kim and who is the president of uh, IAPM. And today we are going to have a, a, a talk on enterprise and a medical renal biopsy, a basic approach. So these are very essential for the postgraduates. They have to be taught how to interpret any kind of biopsy, which we see in day-to-day -day routine biopsy. And uh, the moderator is going to be Dr. Kamal Kumar Kanodia. He is a senior professor and heading the Department of uh, Pathology, Lab Medicine, Transfusion Services, and Immunohematology in the Institute of Kidney Disease and Research Center, and that is at Dr. H. L. Uh, Trivedi Institute of Transplantation Sciences and Ahmedabad, which is very well known and very popular. And, uh, and he also has uh, about 25 years of uh, experience and his main interest involves in renal and liver transplant pathology. And he also holds um, uh, the, uh, uh, the responsibility of conducting PDCC course that is under the uh, icon of Indian College of Pathology. And he is also a fellow of Indian College of Pathology. And he has about uh, 60 publications and also contributed uh, six chapters in uh, different books. With this introduction, Kamal, you may go ahead and conduct a session. Yes, good morning and thank you, madam. At the outset, I just thanks to you for giving the opportunity. And now I introduce Dr. Sita. She is my friend and she is today, she is presenting the interpretation of medical renal biopsy, a basic approach. She is the head of department and professor in Amrita Institute of Medical Science, Kerala. She had the ISN fellowship in uh, 2013 in nephropathology. She has also done the advanced fellowship in 2019. She has done the short term observership in renal pathology at PGI Chandigarh, then Bell Cornell University, New York, and also in the Arcana Laboratories, USA. She is also awarded FRCP London in 2021, last year. She is faculty in charge of PDCC renal pathology course under ICP at uh, Kochi since 2017. She is also the examiner and guide for PDCC renal pathology, MD pathology, and MSC MLT. She is also active member of uh, ISRTP and different other organizations, ISOT, IAPM. She had almost 17 years experience of renal pathology, and uh, she has 35 publications in various national and international journals. So now over to the uh, Dr. Sita for uh, a basic approach to the internet uh, interpretation of medical renal biopsies. As Madam Vipe has told that nowadays the renal biopsies are done at everywhere and the nephropathologists are also there. So for the postgraduate students to know the basic about the renal pathology is nowadays important. I think uh sita will go ahead with this sita please thank you kamal for that uh, sweet introduction and uh, thank you national iapm especially uh, madam kim for the uh, invite for this session so this is a basic presentation i'll be covering it's just like a, it is suited for a postgraduate and uh, I won't be able to cover the entire renal pathology. So we'll be focusing on mainly the glomerular lesions, little bit of tubular and interstitial diseases. Uh, I won't be touching up on the transplant pathology part, but which in itself is a very big topic. So straight away going to the uh, topic. So medical renal disease principally involve the parenchyma of the kidney. So the usual presentations are hematuria, proteinuria, pyuria, oliguria, and renal insufficiency to hypertension. So these are the diseases which are medically managed. It is not, we are not discussing about the surgically managed tumors and neoplasms today. So these diseases affect glomerulate, tubules, interstitium, and vessels. 
So I'll be covering it as uh, the topic under this headings like kidney biopsy, brief uh, indication, processing, light microscopy and special stains are very important. Immunofluorescence study without which we cannot report the uh, renal biopsy. And very briefly about electron microscopy with, because in a resource uh, limited country like uh, ours, like it is used whenever it is absolutely needed, not in all cases. So then the patterns of injury and some clinical syndrome and how the diseases present to an nephropathologist and the reporting pattern if the time permits. Okay, so kidney biopsy is a major event in the history of nephrology and a systematic study of morphology is actually a magic tool which gives a diagnosis and prognostic information definitely in concert with the history and laboratory findings. So all of you are familiar with the urine analysis. This is very important to know each and every details of the strip interpretation or if you are doing it rarely, we are doing it by um, manually. So all the parameters parameters which normal values and what will affect the values everything is important so based on this you are deciding that whether it is a proteinuric illness or whether it is an active sediment which is a nephritic presentation and uh, renal function does you should know the uh, basic values normal levels when it is abnormal so the renal biopsy will provide the diagnosis guide treatment it predicts the prognosis it reveals the pathogenesis and validate out outcome in the studies so what are the indications? The common and in, commonest indication is elevated creatinine or you call it as renal failure. It can be an acute failure, it can be chronic kidney disease or it can be a rapidly progressive renal failure. Uh, with the cause uh, related to it may be a glomerular, tubular or vascular. So the other presentation is proteinuria. The classic example is nephrotic syndrome. So usually it, uh, it is due to permeability, problems in the permeability. Then hematuria, it happens when there is an inflammation or when there is a rupture of glomerular basement membrane. Classical example is nephritic syndrome, your post-infectious or infection-related glomerulonephritis. So biopsy is done percutaneously. It can be an open wedge biopsy or a transregular biopsy. That is how the needle looks under ultrasound. And the uh, main problem is that they have to cut the uh, tissue starting from the cortex. If it is little bit inside, when they fire the gun, it will actually give you only the medulla. So the positioning of needle is very important. And we always earn, mo earn more uh, for the more tissue. So that is the difference between different uh, needle sizes. So when you get an 18 gauge uh, needle sample, sometimes they will get fragmented also. So grossly, we have to have three samples, like for light microscopy and special stain, one in, for immunofluorescent and one for EM. So this is a luxury. You won't get a sample like this in most of the time. So you have to triage the tissue, whatever you are getting for all the studies. So uh, it is divided for light microscopy, immunofluorescence and electron microscopy. So correct fixation is very important and rapid tissue fixation is a must for good morphology. So 10% neutral buffer formula is used for light microscopy, 2 to 3% buffered glutaraldehyde for EM. And the sample for uh, IF, that is immunofluorescence, uh, you have to uh, get it fresh or if it is, has to be transported, it is transported in initial transport medium. It is not a good fixative, but re it retains the antigenicity. So the final result will be, this is light microscopy, that is immunofluorescence, this is electron microscopy. You have to have all this to make a full diagnosis. At least the light microscopy with the special stains, I and IF is a must to decide whether you have to go for an electron microscopy. So uh, you can use a hand lens or the ideal thing is uh, actually dissecting microscopes, but uh, we use the routine microscope for uh, uh, checking the core. This is cortex, this is medulla, you can see a vessel here. These are the glomeruli, okay. This uh, ball with a little bit of RBCs inside are uh, the glomeruli, this is medulla. So you can, under the microscope, you can actually cut the tissue wherever you want. So this is actually, you have to develop the technical expertise by doing it. So various schemes of cutting the uh, cores are available. Usually uh, it should be like two cores so from the edges you can take for EM and the IF and LM, you can divide it like this. 
and light microscopy uh, why i am showing us uh, because the, if from the ribbon if you float the uh, sections like this even if one or two sections are lost sometimes a diagnosis is missed because if the glomeruli is showing a very small lesion uh, uh, somewhere here uh, with the sclerosis, if you miss a few sections here, it will be lost. So it's very important to take all the serial sections onto the slide and we, we actually do 14 slides for each cases and we select the slide for the first panel. Okay, the sectioning is has to be done uh, in 2 to 3 micron because it is critical to evaluate the cellularity. So, the stains are hematoxylin eosin, special stains, periodic acid sheets, John Silver, Mason trichrome. So, the appearance uh, will change according to the uh, stains and these are a must. Actually, three special stains are a must for uh, making a diagnosis. So, uh, the PAS uh, will give you details of the glomerular basement membrane matrix, tubular basement membrane. John Silver uh, stain highlights this component in black and Masson strike chrome colors the extracellular glomerular matrix and tubular basement membrane blue. So different uh, stains have different strengths and in addition you can use the other special stains whenever needed. So that's a list of uh, stain and the uh, highlights of the components. And you can take a snapshot of uh, whatever uh, is given like this uh, and all the references whenever I show because I won't be like uh, describing it because of the lack of time. So uh, you are lucky if you get all the stains like this, a perfectly stained uh, HND, PAS, silver stain and MP stain. And uh, if it is like it needs a special uh, like expertise from the technicians very much because whenever a charred silver comes like it will show you sometimes spooky characters like this otherwise. So adequacy of specimen minimum two cores and uh, 15 to 20 glomeruli uh, at least to not to miss the focal lesion. So it is said that when the uh, whole kidney or the core is 10% uh, of the glomeruli if it is affected you have to have at least 30 glomeruli to have more than 95% chance of sampling at least one affected glomeruli okay so the, if small amount of glomeruli are affected you have to have more tissue for diagnosis but if it is a condition which is affecting all the glomeruli at even uh, you can make the diagnosis with a single glomerulus but uh, you will miss all the other details of tubules and decision with that okay so that is how it's better to have a standard request form because the laziest nephrologist or radiologist can give you details if you have a good request form so this is what we have with the history physical examination investigations and the clinical diagnosis but usually you will get good details from the nephrologist because they depend on us so much for their uh, diagnosis and uh, they value your opinion so it is easy to get details from the nephrology side uh, in most of the situations. So when they fill the form, actually we will get all the details like this and you can decide in which syndrome it falls into. So that is the tray. Uh, you will first uh, see the HND. First, third, sixth and twelfth uh, sections are stained with the HND and seventh section for PAS, eighth section for eighth slide for silver and ninth slide for MT. And this is the IF uh, tissue which is stained by PAS. So what is important is one renal disease can have more than one histological pattern and clinical presentation. The best example is SLE. It can present like a minimal uh, near normal to minimal mesangial hypercellularity to a membranous picture. And one clinical syndrome is caused by many different diseases. The typical example is nephrotic syndrome. You can have minimal change, segmental sclerosis or a membranous to cause the nephrotic syndrome. The, so this should be kept in mind. So kidney has three major compartments, glomerular, tubular, interstitial and vascular compartment. So first we have to try to localize the main site of injury, then to decide the severity and extent and uh, decide whether it is active or chronic. So, uh, going to the details of uh, 
uh, some terminologies. Diffuse means it is more than 50% of the glomerulate are involved in the core. And focal means less than 50% of the glomerulate are involved in the core. So this is pertaining to the whole kidney or at least for us it is pertaining to the cores whatever you are getting. Okay. So that is the importance. And global means it is like pertaining to a single glomerulus. Global is entire glomerulus is involved or the entire tuft is involved. Segmental means it's a part of glomerulus is involved. So like this. So uh, we have to know the morphological patterns. This is how a normal kidney uh, looks, uh, glomerulus looks. This is the vascular pole. This is the tubular pole of the kidney so even if it is looking like normal you will have a diagnosis on that because uh, what happens is when uh, uh, this is uh, the kidney is looking like a near normal but when you have a syndrome of uh, proteinuria or hematuria you have to have further investigation to pinpoint the diagnosis you cannot report it as normal glomerulus when the when it uh, the clinician has done it with a history okay so what are the patterns this is mesangial hypercellularity that is cells in the mesangium is increased this is endocapillary proliferation where there is increase in the cells inside the capillary loop. This is extra capillary proliferation where the, there is a cell increase in cells around the tuft. So whenever it is more than three layers, you call it as a crescent. So normal mesangial hypercellularity, endocapillary proliferation, extra capillary proliferation or crescent. So the other one is fibrinoid necrosis. You can see it here. Let's is sclerosis, segmental sclerosis, hyaluronic glassy astrophilic material. This is a pattern of MPGN, membrano-proliferative pattern. You have thick loops with increase in cellularity, so which gives rise to a lobular accent. Okay, so the other patterns are thick basement membrane and nodular pattern. This is classical example uh, with membranous glomerulonephritis. This classical example is diabetic nephritis. So in the tubules also, you have to know what are the changes. So usually it will be a degenerative change, diaper inclusion or cast inside the tubule like hemoglobin, myoglobin or cast crystals inside the tubules or a viral cytokine. So that is acute tubular injury, vacuolation, cast, which is a abnormal cast, stiff cast. These are crystals, RBC cast, bile cast, hemoglobin cast. This is a chronic hemolysis and hemosiderin in the tubule. In the stesium, you have to know what is uh, there uh, in the interstitium as acute and chronic edema, inflammation, fibrosis, and depositions. That is acute interstitial nephritis, urate crystal. This is chronic. You can see this black area where there is tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis. Vessels, thrombosis, embolization, fibrin, inflammation, arteriolosclerosis. That is how the hypertensive changes look like in various special stains. Hyaline arteriolosclerosis, onion skinning, thrombotic microangiopathy, other embolic renal disease. So, so these are the changes in vessels. In transplant, sometimes uh, like uh, CNI toxicity causes uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. This is vasculitis, peritubular capillaritis, and EVG stain showing the lamellation of elastic membrane. So that is uh, the histology. Now we will move, move to a, an area which is like very bright, which will give you an answer in many of the situations. That is immunofluorescence. We use uh, fluorescent labeled antibodies of uh, <coughs> sorry, immunoglobulins complement kappa and lambda. In, in addition, uh, you can use C4D in allograft. Other stains are albumin, fibrin, collagen for special in, used in special situations. So seven antibodies. G, A, M, C3, C1, Q, Kappa and Lambda. You have to have cryostat section. This uh, and uh, the stain, when it's stain, uh, it is stained, it looks colorless. This is negative and uh, this is positive. You have to take a photograph because it will fade with the exposure of light. 
So this is negative, this is positive, and you have to say whether it is in the mesangium or in the capillary wall, whether it is granular or linear, and fine granular or coarse granular, <coughs> or whether there is any restriction of steam, whether only kappa or lambda is there. So these are the various uh, you know, parameters you have to see when you are reporting the IF. That is fibrin, non-specific accumulation. And so uh, I have already told you, you have to report on positive stain distribution, localization, pattern, and intensity when you report IF. Electron microscopy, I'm not going to much details of this. Uh, you have to do it whenever indicated after LM and IF. So it is pros embedded in plastic hard medium, trimmed, and scout sections are made, stained with tododin blue, and uh, select after selecting the glomerulus, ultra thin sections are made. Okay, so we will move on to the rest of the uh, thing, whatever we have learned. We will try to actually see whether we can apply this knowledge whenever we get cases. So this uh, boy presented with the frothing of urine. And uh, albumin was low, cholesterol high, protein, 4 plus proteinuria, and urine protein was 4.3 grams. So it's a classical presentation of uh, nephrotic syndrome. Penal biopsy was done. The core was looking like this. Uh, the glomerulae were looking essentially normal. There was no chronicity. The tubules were back to back. This is the HND stain. That's a PA stain. There is no increase in cellularity. That's a silver stain, no chronicity anywhere. That's empty stain, no blue areas to note, uh, uh, to show any sclerosis anywhere. Okay, so that is how the glomerulae looked in various special stain. That is PAS, this is silver, this is empty. All are looking almost normal. Okay, so can we report it as normal biopsy? No because we have not seen the immunofluorescence. So immunofluorescence is done. All were negative. IgG, IgG, IgM, C3, C1Q, kappa light chain, lambda light chain, everything is negative. Mm -hmm. So now you know that it is not an immune complex mediated disease and the glomerulae are looking normal. In a young child, the, child, the best possible diagnosis is minimal changes. But the proof comes through electron microscopy, which is not done routinely, they will try for a, a treatment uh, giving steroid. Once it is responding, uh, they will take it as a minimal change. So if it is not responding, sometimes we may have to resort to um, electron microscopy to see whether something else is there. So that is how the EM looks like. Uh, you have the food process effacement. So it is looking like it is plastered over the basement membrane. That is the only change which you can see in electron microscopy. That is going to the next case. It's a 45-year-old male with almost similar history. He presented with nephrotic syndrome. There is no comorbidities. So uh, when the biopsy came, that is the HNT section. It was also looking normal. There is no increase in cellularity, no thickness of loop. There is no extra capillary proliferation also. The tubules are looking back to back normal. So that is PAS. Uh, this is silver stain. This is empty stain. Again, it is normal, looking normal. But it is an adult patient. Again, you have to see whether you have to see the immunofluorescence whether uh, to know whether it is immune complex mediator. So that is the IF uh, uh, tissue stained with the PAS. And when we uh, see the IF, it was staining for IgG positively granular capillary wall location. So it is different from minimal chain. Them. Even though the light microscopy was similar, this has immune complex deposition in the kidney. So this is a membranous glomerulonephritis now because there is granular capillary wall staining which is in a very early stain you could pick up that only through immunofluorescence otherwise you will otherwise you will miss the diagnosis you will report it as a minimal change disease and especially in elderly you have to always do congruent stain to assure that uh, it is not an early amyloid deposition also Okay, so that is how it looks like granular and it is lacing the capillary wall very beautifully. 
so the diagnosis so diagnosis is near normal glomerular tubular interstitial vessel fine granular capillary wall uh, positivity igg c3 kappa lambda negative stains and you will report it as an early membranous glomerular nephritis can you stop the diagnosis like that i'll tell you the details the there is another case so this case actually it is again the same almost same history but here what is different is the light microscopy itself is showing changes because the loops are very rounded thick and it is uh, appear uh, appearing as if it is thick okay so that was the appearance so you have a doubt that it is a membranous nephropathy in the light microscopy itself so see the silver stain it is showing loosened holes on the surface. So this loosened holes are actually the positions where the immune complexes are getting deposited. They are not stained. The basement sta membrane is staining black or brown, but you are seeing the deposits as a stained void area. So you call it as a loosened hole. Okay, so immunofluorescence is positive for IgG. C3, kappa and lambda. So you can report it straight uh, like a membranous glomerular nephritis. But it is not sufficient. You have to tell that whether it is a primary membranous glomerular nephritis or it is a secondary because if it is primary, they can go for the treatment straight. But if it is due to some malignancy, autoimmune disease, they have to treat the cause. So this is a... Um, um, the uh, IHC or IF4 phospholipase A2 receptor antibody is used to determine whether it is a primary membranous uh, nephropathy. So if it is positive, uh, it is called primary membranous. There are other antibodies also uh, are described in the last few years. Uh, so that's a list of that, like PLA2R, THSD7A, NL1, semaphorin B, procadrin, NCAM, exostosin, SGRA. So all these antibodies are described, uh, uh, target antigens are described in the recent past. And this is the references. You can go through this article. So that is PLA2R positive, done at Reno path. This is beautifully positive and it was a primary membranous glomerulonephritis. So electron microscopically, the deposits are in the sub-epithelial region, meaning that uh, epithelium means it is podocyte. Podocytes are called the epithelial cell. So the food processes rest here. And this is the sub-epithelial deposit you are seeing. Here. Okay. So when there are thick loops, all of them look similar on microscopy but uh, all these are different conditions this was a classical membranous glomerulonephritis this was actually a membranous glomerulonephritis in lupus so it is an a membranous lupus on the morphology there is a clue that this is showing mesangial hypercellularity this was actually showing a thick loop but it is a case of diabetes mellitus which is showing a thick loop okay so the diagnosis which are overlooked when you are not doing immunofluorescence. Ideally, you should not do renal biopsy interpretation without IF. So IgA nephropathy, IgM nephropathy, c nephropathy, if you are doing the IF only, you can diagnose all this. Antiglomerular basement membrane disease, lichen associated disease or immunoglobulin, uh, monoclonal immunoglobulin related diseases, you can only detect through the uh, immunofluorescence study and some of the centers uses immunohistochemistry also yeah, especially Britishers uses immunohistochemistry and US people use more uh, immunofluorescence in India almost all the institute uses immunofluorescence to demonstrate the immune complexes so going to the next case it is also a nephrotic syndrome but uh, you are seeing segmental sclerotic areas like this in various special stain and non-specific accumulation of IgM which is uh, well described with the segmental sclerosis. So the diagnosis is focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. That is uh, Columbia classification of uh, uh, FSGS which is, uh, which is actually a morphology based classification. This is the collapsing type. This is tip variant. This is cellular variant. This is perihilar variant. This is NOS. This uh, has the worst prognosis, collapsing, and tip variant has the best prognosis. And now the 
uh, classification has changed and now you classify them according to the etiology and this article gives you the details of that. Next case is uh, a patient who is asymptomatic presented with uh, uh, he was asymptomatic but uh, there was hypertension mild renal failure uh, when he went for a pre-employment checkup. So there was subnephrotic proteinuria and microscopic hematuria for the patient uh, renal biopsy was done. So that is the core which has some areas of chronicity. You can see a obsolescent glomerulus here. There is mesangial hypercellularity which is highlighted more by the uh, special stain PAS. There is a synecae here, synecae here and there is a sclerotic area here. So the uh, biopsy shows uh, some chronicity, global sclerosis, mesangial hypercellularity, there is a segmental sclerosis here and there is a chronic uh, chronicity uh, in the tubular interstitium and glomerulus. You can see global sclerosis here also and this area is sclerosed. You can see a small strip here also sclerosed and tubular atrophy is there. So, which is highlighted in the MP like blue areas. So, on uh, immunofluorescence, it showed IgA in the mesangium. So, IgA, C3, kappa and lambda. Usually, IgA nephropathies show more lambda than kappa. So, that is a case of IgA nephropathy. So, whenever you report IgA nephropathy, you have to give the Oxford classification also. So, that is stating a statement about the mesangial cellularity, endocapillary proliferation, segmental sclerosis, tubular atrophy and crescents. You have to give the score like that when you report IgA nephropathy and that is the reference for that. You can go through that in detail and uh, the parameters which has to be reported when you report IgA nephropathy. And this is another case again with a similar immunofluorescence, but the presentation was pres uh, different. The uh, kit presented with the palpable purpura, and this was a case of HSP or IgA vasculitis nephritis. So, uh, only seeing the immunofluorescence, you cannot make a diagnosis. The IgA nephropathy also will show similar picture, but you have to always correlate with the clinical picture to give a diagnosis. Next case is a 12 year boy who had a history of pyoderma, BP was high, he was in renal failure, complements were low, urine protein was there, there was active sediment, RBC cast, RBCs and there was subnephrotic proteinuria. So the classical nephritic syndrome. So the biopsy was looking like that. Lot of cells everywhere in the glomerulus, in the mesangium, inside the capillary loop and almost many of the cells are neutrophils. So when a picture is like this and if it is affecting the whole glomeruli, uh, you will call it as a diffuse, acute, proliferative glomerulonephritis. So the IF was starry sky like. In the capillary walls, coarse, walls, coarse granular, IgG was present, C3 was also present. I have not put like four pictures of positivity here because almost all were looking like this. And IgA, IgM, C1Q uh, were negative. So that was the uh, immunofluorescence finding. So it was a case of diffuse acute proliferative glomerulonephritis, immune complex mediated and infection related. Now the terminology has uh, changed. We are not like calling it as post infectious always. Sometimes when the uh, patient presents uh, present with a nephritic picture, the infections are still present. So uh, you call it as an infection related glomerulonephritis. So that's the next case. 55 year old gentleman, he was uh, hypertensive for past one year, pallor was there, BP was high, protein creatinine ratio was the 3.2, urea creatinine 68 and 3.2. So it was a nephrotic, nephritic picture. Patient has nephrotic protein urea. So instead of the 24 hour urine protein, sometimes they use spot uh, urine creatinine ratio, which is roughly equivalent to the gram of protein per day. So it is a nephrotic nephritic picture. This is the core. Some global sclerosis is there and glomeruli are large looking more cellular. 
So when you see this, there is a lobular accentuation, thick loop, there is increase in cellularity. So we have already learned that when you see a picture like this, it is called a membranoproliferative pattern of injury. So there is increase in cellularity, matrix increase, thick loop, you can even see the double contours in the silver stain. Okay, so that is a classical appearance of MPGN or membranoproliferative glomerular nephritis. Tubular interstitium has scarring and there was hypertensive vascular changes also. So immunofluorescence wise, it was showing IgG, C3, C1, Q, kappa and lambda. So that is a immune complex mediated membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. So previously we used to call them as type 1, type 2 and type 3. Now the classification has changed. Now it is called, so that is the diagnosis. You have to comment, up, uh, comment on the glomerulae, tubular interstitium and uh, vessels. So the classification has changed. Now it is classified depending on the immunofluorescence, whether it is immune complex mediated or whether it is only related to the complement. Okay, when it is immune complex mediated, you have to find out the reasons. It could be an infection related or it is autoimmune related or a monoclonal gammopathy associated MPGN. So when it is complement related, you have to see the electron microscopy to decide whether it is a C3 glomerulonephritis or it is a dense deposit disease. Okay, so the classification is more directed towards etiology now so that the treatment is easy. So next case is a 74 year old uh, lady who presented with uh, uh, hypertension and renal failure. Urine albumin was present, plenty of RBCs was there and clinically this was a case of rapidly progressive renal failure. And the clinician thought that it is a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis because there were plenty of RBCs, urine sediments were active. So that is the picture we got. This is the core and you can see the glomerulae and you are not seeing the loop clearly. There are a lot of cells in that. The tubules are not back to back. There is space in between. So there is edema and lot of inflammatory cells in between. You can see them here. So you are seeing a mass of cells here bounded by the Bowman's capsule. So you don't know where is the tuft, where is, uh, where is the extracapillary proliferation when you see H and D like this. So go to the special stains. So now you can see the tuft here. That's a PA stain, silver stain, empty. That's another P, uh, silver showing the tuft clearly. And the proliferation is outside. So the tuft is such as, as such not cellular. The tuft is not proliferative, but there is a crescent outside. Okay, so this is all the glomerulae were looking like that. So if it is more than 70, uh, 50 percent of glomerulae are having crescent, you call it as a crescentic glomerulonephritis. So it had linear capillary wall staining for IgG. So that is a anti-GPM antibody glomerulonephritis, classical linear IgG. So when you see crescents on microscopy, the further classification is based on immunofluorescence. When there is diffuse linear IgG, it is anti-GBM disease. When it is IF negative, it is due to posi-immune vasculitis where you will identify ANCAS. And if it is granular capillary wall staining, you have to name it according to the IF pattern. If it is full house, it is lupus, IgA. If it is IgA, IgA nephropathy, like that. So that was another case which showed different aged crescents in this. So this was a case of posi-immune glomerulonephritis where ANCAS were present. Classically, it was from a case of GPA, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, earlier known as Wegener's granulomatosis. Next case is a 30-year-old 30, 30 lady presented with skin rashes, joint pain, anemia. ANA was positive and the SM was positive. Clinical diagnosis was lupus nephritis. So straight diagnosis lupus, but you have to classify it. There is increase in cellularity. There is acute interstitial nephritis. So this is the classical wire loop lesions, thick loops. There is a crescent here. There is increase in cellularity, endocapillary proliferation, extracapillary proliferation, wire loop. And this is what is called hyaline thrombi. 
actually they are not hyaline there are that is not thrombe this is actually immune complex itself so when you see the silver stain it will look really beautiful the sub epithelial deposit will stain like this like loose and holes you can see the globules hyaline thrombe here you can see the double condor here denoting the intramembranous deposit you can see the wire loop here this is in the sub epithelial location so silver stain shows you the deposit in all areas so that is full house immunofluorescent g a m c3 c1 q kappa lambda everything is bright okay so that is a classical ig uh, uh, lupus nephritis class 4 plus 5 because there is a component of membranous in that you have to report activity index and chronicity index also with that how active it is how chronic it is so that is the classification you can go through this article and what is the revision which has come this article tells you that and that that is the nih activity and chronicity index you have to know whether there is inflammatory infiltrate, fibrinoid necrosis, hyaline deposits are there, viral loop hyaline thrombi, crescents are there, interstitial inflammation is there, and it is scored, and maximum score is 24. This is a chronicity score, fibrous crescent, global sclerosis, atrophy, fibrosis. The maximum score is 12. So depending on that, you have to score it to give the full diagnosis. And you will get uh, immunofluorescence in other compartments also. Like this, uh, there is this tissue ANA, which is the positivity in the uh, tubular epithelial nuclei. Sometimes you can see it in the peritubular capillaries also. So everywhere when the stain comes, you have to think of lupus. That is uh, electron microscopy, sub epithelial deposits, and subendothelial deposits. So when there is glomerular injury, how to interpret IF? You go through this algorithm, you can take a screenshot and go through this in detail later. So next case is a 54, uh, 52 year old male with a history of diabetes and the patient has nephrotic syndrome. So a uh, clinician wanted to know whether it is a nephrotic uh, syndrome related to uh, diabetes or not. So this was the appearance nodules, sarcomal seal, Wilson nodules, there is chronicity, global sclerosis, on PAS, it is positive, silver positive, immunofluorescence shows a faint stain along the TBM and GBM, it is not a specific stain as bright as uh, anti-GBM, so it is a class 3. Five yeah. minutes. Yeah, yeah. I'll finish it fast. So it's a diabetic nephropathy. You can see a small fibr capsular drop here and fibrin cap here. And that is classical diabetic nephropathy. PA is positive, silver positive, blue on empty, and this is the HND. Okay, that gives you the diabetic nephropathy classification. Okay, once there is a nodule, it is class 3. Okay, so this is a mimicker, which is a light chain deposition. This is only kappa light chain stained with that and silver is negative. So this case, I'll, this is again an aphrotis syndrome, mesangial deposits, silver negative, PA is negative, both are negative. Okay, so that is amyloid. Only lambda light chain positive, so it's a primary amyloidosis. So that is a yet another case with the mesangial hypercellularity and uh, paint like uh, immunofluorescent DNA JV9 positive. So that was a case of fibrillary glomerulonephritis. So these are all examples of mesangial nodules or mesangial depositases. So this chart is there in your heptin stall which gives you the details of how to differentiate between all of this. So, two PAS negative ones are amyloid collagenofibrotic, two silver positive ones are diabetes and immunoidiopathic nodular glomerulosclerosis. Rest of them you have to decide it on special stains and electron microscopy. So, that is how it looks like. Immunotactoid has uh, um, tubules. These are fibrils, amyloid, small fibrils, big fibrils. Okay. So, there was a case of 12-year-old boy with isolated hematuria, sensory neural uh, hearing loss. 
the biopsy was looking quite normal immunofluorescence was negative that is splitting and multilamination on em or called basket weaving with the podocyte order of gabm scallop so that is alport syndrome you have special uh, immunofluorescence to demonstrate the alpha 3 uh, chain also next case uh, polyhydramnosin mother family history of uh, renal disease baby was anuric and that was a picture there was a lot of crystals in that when it is polarized it was looking like that so that was a case eye of study was negative this is the one cause stain so that was a case of crystal nephropathy morphology favoring oxalosis this case was diagnosed of primary oxaluria type that is a 52 year old male presented with a fracture neck of femur 24 hour urine protein was high but albumin was traced so think of a paraprotein like uh, in this condition so there were casts which were stiff fractured pas poor with giant cell reaction okay classical cast nephropathy with the lambda light chain deposition lambda light chain positivity in a case of multiple myeloma so that gives you the details of monoclonal monoclonal immunoglobulin associated renal diseases there is a beautiful article you can go through this which gives all the details of plasma cell related glomerular tubular interstitial diseases which can be uh, present so we have gone through all these entities these are the most common entities uh, you are asked to describe your uh, you have to learn during your pg period and which may come in your exams also so minimal chain focal segmental membranous membrane of proliferative lupus post infectious or infection related presentic IgA nephropathy diabetic nephropathy amyloidosis and its mimickers cast nephropathy oxalosis atn tubulon distrital disease atherombolic renal disease we have covered almost all so when you report uh, count the number of glomeruli give all active and chronic lesions quantitative tubules also in the system vessels also do that immunofluorescence i have already discussed where is it and how is it appearing what is the intensity electron microscopy also similar uh, see the glomerulate status of podocyte thickness of gpm position of deposit substructure and missile features so when you when there is a renal biopsy, gather the clinical information and think whatever it is possible. Morphology, glomerulate, tubule, interstitial vessels. Make a morphological diagnosis. Do further investigation. Refine your diagnosis in the order of probability. Grade it. Stage it. Do a clinical pathological uh, correlation. Refine the possibilities further and think, does it make a sense? Then only give the diagnosis. So renal biopsy helps to classify renal disease, plan treatment, estimate outcome and predict our prognosis. Immunofluorescence study is a must chain renal biopsy interpretation. In future, a considerable amount of molecular genetic data are anticipated to be added to the biopsy details. So a detailed communication with the clinician leads to an accurate diagnosis and clinical pathological correlation and correct diagnosis. And these are my references. These are some recent articles. Uh, classic article which describe the renal biopsy and approach this is yet to come as book this is an online article in press which has come in AJKD so these are the standard textbooks thank you thank you Sita for very elaborative and good presentation your pictures are also very beautiful and you have covered most of the basic things of uh, renal pathology starting from this uh, processing fixation staining which is very important to know about the all four stains which is required for renal pathology and uh, other modalities like immunofluorescence em is also required whenever it is indicated nowadays they are telling almost uh, uh, 75 percent of the cases are helpful uh, when you go for the em biopsies and uh, Sita, you have mentioned about this uh, different disease cases and uh, there are, when we report the, see the light microscopy in the renal biopsies, we see yeah. different, different patterns. Basically, yeah. we see the patterns like mesangial yeah. proliferation, thickening of the basement membrane, 
MPGN like Python, FSGS, yeah, they are. So by this directly, we cannot go to the diagnosis. We just yeah. see the light microscopy pattern. Yeah. So they are only patterns. That is the yeah. basic importance yeah. to this. In yes. itself, they are not forming the diagnosis. So yes, patterns yes, yes. are patterns, but you have to know the pathogenesis and yes. etiology. Yes. And uh, so, at the time of diagnosis, you have to correlate with the investigation patient history which is very necessary for any diagnosis then you go for the immunofluorescence that will give you the idea of the diagnosis and even that sometimes still you need the immuno electron microscopy like uh, mpgn pattern so can you highlight few patterns uh, and differential diagnosis of that and one more thing that uh, recent uh, you have mentioned about crescents. Sometimes we get the pseudo crescent, like in collapsing globulopathy. Yeah. So kindly just um, give the details of differentiation of this, uh, both the things, because for the PG students especially, yeah. how to differentiate the uh, pseudo with the pure uh, crescents. Yes. Yeah. Regarding the pattern, I have uh, just indicated in the presentation itself. If, if you have a mesangial proliferative pattern, so that is not a diagnosis. It is just a pattern which you are seeing under microscopy and uh, special stains. It could be, depending on the immunofluorescence, this can be just a minimal change disease with mesangial hypercellularity. It could be an IgA nephropathy. It could be an class 2 lupus nephritis. So all this information you are getting only after doing your uh, immunofluorescence study. So on seeing the morphology alone, you can just say that it is a mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis, which doesn't mean anything for you, the clinician. If they have to treat them, they have to know the etiology of that. And yeah. crescents also, after doing the immunofluorescence study only, you are telling that it is whether it is anti-GBM or it is posi-immune or it is due to immune complex. And the question of uh, is, uh, crescent, pseudo crescents and crescent. Pseudo crescents actually, uh, uh, the, uh, those form when the tuft is collapsed and uh, there is a hypertrophy of the photocytes. Okay, so all the cells look similar in that when it is a pseudo crescent. But actual crescents, when there is a GBM break or when there is an inflammation, there are different cells in the crescent. There will be pyrethral epithelial cell, there will be podocyte uh, cell, there will be inflammatory cell, fibrin. So all of these things you will see in the crescent and you can age, uh, the age of crescent also you have to mention. Whether it is cellular, fibrocellular, fibrous to like uh, discuss with the clinician that like this is a cellular crescent. So if you treat it may respond. If it is all fibrous crescent you have to tell it is all gone. If the active treatment may not help. So you have to communicate it to the clinician in a way that what is reversible, what is not reversible in all the cases. That gives you an added value for your report. Yes. Uh, and can you highlight something about the thrombotic microangiopathy? Uh, because this is yeah. the muscular yeah, part. Yeah. And so I haven't covered it in detail than the transplant pathology part also I have skipped because of lack of time. But the thrombotic microangiopathy is also a pattern diagnosis, I should say, yes. because it can occur. The most common cause is uh, malignant hypertension. Whenever there is a uh, very high, severe hypertension, the endothelium is damaged. You will get uh, uh, severe um, onion skinning of the uh, vessels and the RBCs are difficult to pass through that. They will, uh, uh, there is an uh, injury to the endothelium. Uh, then the RBCs get fragmented inside that. So that is the most common thrombotic microangiopathy you see. You can see it in other conditions also, like you are a hemolytic uremic syndrome, HELP syndrome, especially related to the uh, to uh, pregnancy. You can see it in uh, different drugs when the, in the transplant setting when you use the calcineurin inhibitors like a cyclosporin or a tacrolimus the toxicity will give rise to this type of uh, uh, 
uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. Sometimes you will get even in the, some malignancies, especially the mucin secreting adenocarcinomas will produce endothelial injury and cause thrombotic microangiopathy. So giving a diagnosis of thrombotic microangiopathy alone doesn't mean anything. You have to tell that what is the cause for mm. that. And especially yeah, in the transplant yeah. setting, you will see it in with the antibody mediator rejection also. So uh, you have to correlate with your clinical setting and the other investigation to pinpoint a diagnosis. Yes. So, so identifying the patterns is all uh, is very important. That is a starting step, but you should not like stop with that. Yeah. And many times we see the tubular interstitial. Uh, Yes, madam. Can we ask the audience? Anybody has any yes. questions or yeah, anything anybody. like that? Because yes, yes. I don't think it is possible to cover the whole spectrum yeah. in yeah, 30 yeah. to 45 yeah, minutes now. Yeah. Anybody point wants point. any clarification? You can ask them. Please ask. Yeah. Anybody? Actually, there is no uh, if you know come in, in the chat. Somebody said it very uh, well presented. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you it was very well presented. And I think photographs are fantastic. Yeah. Anybody wants to add anything or any comment or any query? I think everybody has been given the yeah. license to talk up, speak up also. So uh, just not only writing down in the chat box. Yeah, somebody mentioned that, uh, can you show the pseudo crescent image? <laughs> I think. <laughs> you can go back. You can go back to your slides if you can. No, find it is it. like I haven't shown a pseudo crescent map. I That's have right, shown a shown. true crescent only in my presentation. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think we were discussing about a pseudo crescent yeah, only, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I think there is in the chat box and, uh... and there is no. I think just one only, only. So I can I just uh, interrupt, Sita? I think you had a slide of yeah. collapsing glomerulopathy. You could just yeah. show it for them. Okay, I'll try to go. At back. least a rough idea. It get. was in a in a chart, so I don't yeah. know whether I'll be. It was a picture of collapsing just glomerulopathy. You can go back. Yeah, I'll try it. Again. It's in that FSGS classification. Yeah. I think that was in collapse, uh, Columbia Classic yeah. Classic Italia. Yeah. Uh, it was the second, uh, just following the second case of. Uh, okay. Yeah, this one. So this, this, I think this one. Oh, it was this. Columbia classification. Yes. Yeah, this yeah. One. This yes. One. Can this you one. see this. that? Okay. Yes. So this is like uh, the last picture, which is showing a collapse loop, and there is a podocyte hypertrophy around that. All the cells look similar. No, there is no fibrin in that. There is no inflammatory cells in that. I wanted to add something that whenever you see the crescent, uh, it is from the parietal cell mainly, which yeah. originate from the Bowman's capsule. So the crescents uh, or the, when the, they are proliferating towards the glomeruli, tough, from oh, Bowman so. capsule to that. And yes. whenever there is a uh, collapsing, are there now that is from the podocytes. So they originate from the Bowman cap, towards Bowman capsule, from the capillary tough towards Bowman capsule. So here yes. you can see there is some uh, gap between the cellularity and uh, Bowman capsule. Bowman's capsule. Okay. Yeah, and there are different other features like they are more of a uh, plump type of cells okay. and you may get sometimes uh, hyaline deposits protein resorption droplets, droplets like that. inside yeah. that yeah. maybe like this here this one is showing that yes yes so that will help you to differentiate between this oh, one another question that when will you say it's fsgs whether there should be attachment to basement membrane no need not be but when there is an attachment to the basement membrane, that is also considered as a focal segmental uh, glomerulosclerosis diagnosis. You need not have the addition to diagnose focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Hmm. If the segment is sclerosis, you can give it as focal segmental. Yeah, sclerosis. there is. You don't get always sinicky formation in the formation. Yes. Thank you, Arina, ma'am, for uh, pointing out that uh, this thing for the example of pseudotrescence. Any any more comments? Anything, Doctor uh, Aruna? Do you like to add anything for the uh, postgraduates? Any comment? 
I think you that know. was wonderful presentation by Dr. Sita yeah. Lakshmi. Mm -hmm. this, this should be enough for the PGs if they concentrate on this. It's wonderful, especially the tables that Dr. Sita Lakshmi showed. They can keep them in mind and uh, that will help them in the exams. It was wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. Then YouTube also will be there for some days in the YouTube. So you can just go back to yeah, those YouTube references. That, yeah. 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 YouTube will be available. Yes. Learn. Further. Yeah. Kamal, any more co comments? No, I think it's over because uh, uh, she has covered most of the things in netty renal biopsies. Uh, because another thing is that they're transplant uh, setup, but yeah. uh, again, the different uh, things, and it's a very elaborative and long discussion. Yeah, it's a program. very elaborative presentation, yes. uh, like uh, I should yes, say. Yes. I have been covered much of like as a case based uh, based uh, uh, presentation for the tubular and the stretcher man vessels also. Yes. Lot of other things are also needed, but uh, mainly the glomerular uh, diseases I try to cover. Yes, yes. This presentation. Okay. So, so I think uh, with those comments, and um, from the speakers, from the uh, moderator, and also from the Dr. Aruna, I think uh, I have to say thank you very much. It was really elaborative, and you have spent time collecting your cases so that you can show a panel of different types of changes, and which would be really helpful for the postgraduates who ever had attended, and also, as you have said, the YouTube will be available to everybody. I think with these few comments, I think uh, I have to say thank you very much. And then this should be the end of this. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you, Aruna, ma'am, also for the wonderful comments. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.